Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I want you to know I've had a marketing agency for many, many years, marketing and communications, called The Rainmaking Company. I've always felt that all of marketing was in the realm of physics, that most people didn't know that, but apparently marketing is finally getting confirmation as being a part of science. And there's something called neuromarketing where brain science and marketing meet. Neuromarketing has been the subject of both fascination and dread by a lot of people around the world. Dread out of concern that this science in the area of marketing could bypass the human ability to make our own decisions. I got an email a couple of months ago by a renowned business academy asking me to vote and to put in a letter against neuromarketing being used on this planet. And the truth is I didn't know enough about it and I hadn't done my due diligence and I did not send it. But I've invited Roger Dooley, who is the founder of neuroscienceMarketing.com, who has probably more understanding of this than a lot of the people walking the earth. There are others, but he's one of them. And I'm very delighted that you're here today. Thank you for being a guest on It's Rainmaking Time. Well, thanks, Kim. I'm glad to be here. I want you to define what neuromarketing is and how it's being used. And I want the full skinny on it. Okay. Well, first of all, there's not really a, a total agreement as to what neuromarketing even includes, I'd say. Uh, my own definition is rather broad, uh, and uh, I include both sort of hard neuroscience, which could include a technology like uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging brain scans or EEG scans, uh, and, but also uh, somewhat uh, softer uh, stuff, for instance, uh, behavioral research. Uh, to me, uh, neuromarketing is an extension of uh, the concept of psychology and marketing, uh, and what neuroscience is doing is giving us a chance to peer inside the black box. I think that uh, for years, marketers have understood that people don't always behave in a totally rational manner, and they've attempted to uh, address that with their marketing pitches, uh, but now we're beginning to see a little bit of uh, why and how that happens in people's heads. So. Uh, I think uh, if you ask different people for a definition of neuromarketing, you will get different answers. But uh, in very general terms, uh, it's the use of brain science and marketing. Why are people scared of the brain science? Is it because the brain science is being used when it comes to directing the attention of the consumers to bypass the part of the brain that's rational? Well, I, I think that is uh, why some people are concerned, but I don't think it's a valid concern. I've addressed that a few times in my neuromarketing blog. The, uh, the fear seems to be that somehow marketers will develop super ads, and these ads will uh, more or less uh, take over people's uh, brains and turn them into buying zombies. Uh, in fact, uh, that, uh, if that were possible, it would have been done already uh, long before people invented uh, fMRI machines. Uh, we've had very skillful advertisers and marketers for decades who've done some fantastic work. And if only by sheer chance, uh, they would have stumbled across uh, some of these ads. And certainly, uh, some ads are very successful. And I think that uh, many types of ads uh, for decades, you know, nothing to do with um, brain scans, I uh, have attempted to uh, sort of bypass our conscious thought or uh, take advantage of uh, how our brains work. If you uh, put a, uh, an attractive woman in an ad that's geared toward men, uh, to some degree you're bypassing a rational thought process and uh, appealing uh, directly to some part of their brain. Uh, the same with uh, shots of uh, food or with a, with a whole host of things you can do to uh, sort of uh, bypass that uh, rational uh, thought, but uh, in fact, nobody has developed these super ads yet. Uh, there, there's no ad that has uh, simply driven us to run out to the store and buy a product, uh, and it won't happen with neuromarketing either. Are you sure about that? Because you sound really confident that it won't happen with neuromarketing, but science is very developed. We know things now about science that people wouldn't even believe even existed 20 years ago. 
That's how far science is. So if you follow science like with nanotechnology and you look at the fact that we can actually access the past, the present, and the future through science with remote viewing and all kinds of other things that are happening. The fact that we have the law of accelerating returns that Ray Kurzweil and George Gilder talked about, how progress can be exponentiated so quickly. Are you sure about that? Well, I don't know that uh, we can be sure about anything in the future uh, in, in this technology or anything else. And uh, Ray Kurzweil, for one, does predict uh, specifically in relation to brain scanning technology that uh, our the resolution of that technology in both uh, time and uh, space or in time in three dimensions uh, will be, uh, in fact, increasing exponentially. And it's going to be, it's one of his core uh, concepts that went into his book, The Singularity is Near. And so there, the technology is getting better, uh, but I just don't see uh, that it will be able to produce uh, ads that are infinitely better than what's done in the past. I think really the promise of neuromarketing is to screen out the dud ads, the ones that simply don't work. Uh, I know that we've all seen those, uh, even sometimes on Super Bowl commercials where people have spent millions of dollars to air these things where uh, viewers look at it and really uh, it doesn't influence them in any positive way toward the brand, toward the product, or anything else. It doesn't motivate them. Uh, they just wonder why did that person just spend two or three million dollars. And uh, neuromarketing is one way that marketers can use to determine if an ad has the potential of working or if it's, if it's just a uh, dud, if it's not influencing the consumers at all. And, and I think there, it's, it's an imperfect science right now. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did an analysis specifically of Super Bowl commercials, and uh, one study uh, that happened to use fMRI technology. Say what that uh, is, too, would you? I'm sorry, Roger. Can you just sure. tell the public what fMRI technology is sure, and what it does? Sure, it's functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and this is a, a very expensive device that... Uh, is uh, was first applied for medical and research purposes, but it's been uh, applied uh, occasionally for uh, marketing and other types of research purposes as well. And the uh, individual slides into a uh, long uh, confining tube surrounded by giant magnets, and uh, it gives you a three three D image of what's going on inside the person's brain. And by what's going on, I mean different areas are lighting up to different uh, degrees. So uh, scientists can interpret this data data and say, "Gee, the uh, area of the brain responsible for." Uh, processing visual information is lighting up or uh, there seems to be a, uh, a reaction in the amygdala that's associated with fear, strong emotions, and so on. Uh, it's, they, they certainly uh, at this point uh, can't uh, read actual thoughts. Uh, they, they're doing some interesting work at Carnegie Mellon University with fMRI uh, and they have actually been able to identify uh, what type of picture uh, an individual is looking at from the patterns they see in the brain. So there, there is some rather interesting work going on, but uh, that's, that's fMRI. The, the limitation of fMRI right now from a marketing research or um, any other standpoint uh, is that uh, it's a very costly machine. Uh, it costs millions of dollars. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, it uh, you, know, you can only fit one individual in the machine at a time, and they'll probably be in there for uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes or something at least. And uh, it's uh, they are not able to interact with the world around them very well because they're in this uh, MRI tube. So uh, you can show them uh, by using a mirror, you can show them uh, video or uh, other types of visual material. Uh, they can push a button uh, in order to uh, register a response or, or uh, take an action of some kind. Uh, but but by and large, it's limited. That you you couldn't, uh, for instance, uh, walk around in a store with uh, an fMRI machine. It's uh, uh, and as a result, the sample sizes tend to be quite small as well. Uh, so that when you read about an fMRI study, you find that uh, typically only five people or ten people or fifteen people were tested, which by marketing uh, market research standards isn't a lot of people.